I'm going to tell you about our latest product, product and project um, that we've been working on for the past few years with collaborators across all of North America, and it's pretty impactful. So hold on to your seats. Get, get started. All right, so on International Bat Appreciation Day on April 17th, 2023, we released the State of the Bats report. This is the first ever report of its kind um, sharing the conservation status and the primary threats that are facing bats in our continent. Um, so globally, there are Frozen, there we go. Uh, 1,462 bat species. That is the most current count. You can write it down from when you're, you're sharing how diverse uh, bats are across the world. But today we're gonna be focusing on, and in the report, the state of the bats report, we're focusing on 154 species that are near and dear to our hearts. The ones that we're seeing flying over our homes, taking sips out of our swimming pools, uh, roosting in the trees of our forests, and maybe uh, even in caves on your property. So we have quite a bit of diversity here, but most of that is driven by the high diversity that we find in Mexico. So we have species, 17 species are found in Canada, 44 species in the United States and uh, 142, I think my subtitles are cutting that off, 142 species are found in Mexico. So these numbers do not add up to 154, and that's because there are species that span all three countries. There are also species that are only found in the U.S. and Mexico or species that are only found in the U.S. and Canada. So uh, there is a, it's a mix, but in total, 154 unique species. So this is one of our, our superstar species that spans all three continents or all three countries of North America. And this is uh, the pallid bat, uh, a really beautiful guy that loves uh, living in the deserts, but also goes all the way up into the north. So very versatile species. So as um, we all know, bats are very important. I'm assuming that is why you're here listening to more information about bats. So I'm going to reiterate, hopefully, things that you already know, but why bats are so important, why we need them, and really why I've dedicated my life to trying to conserve them and protect them. And for those of us in the United States and Canada, the number one reason that we love bats is because they are so good at eating insects. They eat, and more broadly than insects, arthropods, but they are the number one predator of nocturnal insects. Most bat species are insectivorous. It's about 70% um, globally, and almost all of our species in the United States are insectivorous and all of the species in Canada eat insects. And one of the big things that they do for us um, that are known as ecosystem services is that they are consuming insects that are in particular pests to agricultural crops. So one of the main ones that here in Texas is being eaten by some of these bat species is the corn earworm moth. And so bats are going to be reducing these pest populations and reducing our need to apply pesticides, insecticides, and then in the long run, that continues to keep the environment healthy and saves um, economically for farmers having to apply those pesticides. And there's a study that has shown that these services in the United States alone add up to about $23 billion a year in savings to the agricultural sector. So that's pretty incredible. Another reason that uh, these bats in the United States and Mexico are so important is that they pollinate commercially and 
ecologically, economically valuable plants. Um, in particular, one of my favorites is the tequila agave that you can see this bat here pollinating. So they are the hummingbirds of the night and are kind of going along, putting their heads into flowers, drinking that nectar, and then spreading that pollen around and keeping um, those plants reproducing, genetically diverse, and um, there for us to take advantage of and maybe even make some tequila. Down in Mexico, there are also species of bats that are frugivorous or fruit eating bats. And these guys are not only some of the cutest bats that are out there, such as this little leaf nose bat holding a fig, um, but they also are really important for seed dispersal. So because bats fly and these guys eat a lot of fruit, as they're flying, they are uh, disposing of the seeds that they did not eat. And in their guano droppings, as they fly over forests, they are essentially distributing those seeds away from the, the mother plant so that then they can spread out and grow elsewhere. And so what where that becomes really important is when we have areas of deforestation, particularly in like the rainforest, these bats are the ones that are flying long distances and those seeds are able to drop into deforested areas. And the species in particular that they feed on are some of the early successional species. So those those trees that really help get the ecosystem regrowing and regenerating. So it's really important that they are out there distributing seeds to these degraded and disturbed um, kind of areas in the tropics. Another really cool thing that bats do for us is they generate quite a bit of income for many communities. So there are a lot of incredible bat viewing sites. This is some video from the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, which brings in millions of dollars to the city of Austin every year as people come in to literally just sit and watch the bats as they emerge from this incredible maternity colony in Austin. But there's many, many other sites across the US that people are going to just to sit and appreciate the bats. And every time they go there as tourists to appreciate these uh, incredible animals, they are also bringing their money with them and spending them and supporting those local economies. So why did we do all this work to assess the state of the bats? You know, we know the bats are important. You know, there are some species that we know are imperiled. They're being listed as endangered in these countries um, individually. So Canada has um, its, its endangered species listings. In the US, we have the Endangered Species Act um, that just is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year and is protecting numerous bat species in our country. And then also in Mexico, there are federal protections for endangered species. So, you know, with these species, we feel like we know what's going on. But really, those endangered species are just a, a small number of the diversity of species that we have across our continent. So we, we have big knowledge gaps in what's going on with many other species. So even if they were threatened or endangered, we wouldn't know because bats are hard to uh, study. You know, they're flying around at night. They're cryptic. Not all of them are roosting in these big caves and bridges so that we can go watch them easily. Some of them are out there roosting alone in a tree. It's really hard to count them. So what we did was in, we uh, brought together all of the bat researchers that we knew and conservationists and experts and assessed the conservation status of species, of all of the species of bats in North America. And along with wanting to know the conservation status of all of these species, not just the ones that are 
we know are threatened or endangered. Uh, we were also able to identify areas where we have knowledge gaps, where maybe we don't even have experts that know about them. And then the other goal was to be able to put out a report like this. Birds get a lot more attention than bats. So there's been state of the bat or state of the birds reports for years coming out of the US and Canada and then even at the global scale. So it's about time that we uh, responded with our own state of the bats report. And that's what I'm sharing here today. And then you can also check out online at stateofthebats.org anytime you want. So I'm just going to tell you a very brief background on what we did to get this data. And it's called an expert elicitation. So it is a difficult procedure because you are essentially trying to get the all of the knowledge out of an individual expert that they know about a species without doing a particular, you know, in-depth data collection study on that species. So over maybe the decades of experience that one expert might have, how can they bringing that all together and capturing that within this framework? And so, and then also trying to reduce things like biased and um, capture the amount of uncertainty, overconfidence, things like this to make the data really meaningful and useful. So this expert elicitation happened um, in this very formalized uh, process and 108 experts contributed to this. And many of these experts assessed- Hey Amanda, sorry, the, the audio of the video is- Oh, okay. Do you want me to just wait? How about we do a stop share for a second? And I will reshare in a second so we can resync up. All right, let's, is this looking okay, Linda? Perfect. Cool. All right, so we um, have 108 experts that were doing this expert elicitation, also started at the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, that uh, brought its own challenges. And we created an online portal to do this um, across all three countries. And many of these experts, uh, assessed numerous species. It was a lot of work on all of their parts. So we really want to thank all of the experts that participated in making this happen. And then also um, the groups that we worked with. So really this project was um, envisioned by the North American Bat Conservation Alliance, which was formed by the trilateral and had federal support to bring together um, federal representation across Canada, the US and Mexico to talk and share about bat issues at a continental scale. And then also with support um, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service in particular and the North American Bat Monitoring Program. So after years of collecting data and these experts working very hard to share their knowledge, we finally had our state of the bats report. And this is a 12 page, very uh, easy to read, beautiful report that's meant for you to look at and share with your friends and family and, you know, gain more support for, for bats and let people know that they're worth conserving and there, there are things that all of us can do to help them. So also, um, because this is a tri-national effort, we have it in available in Spanish and in French. And the biggest kind of outcome of this report is this simple figure. So this summary showing these uh, conservation statuses across these different countries. So we have our 17 species in Canada, our 44 species in the United States and our 142 species in Mexico. 
Uh, each box represents a species and then the color code represents its conservation status. So we have um, this kind of pink color being the vulnerable species. I think the subtitles, let me turn them off for a second. Um, or having our imperiled species in this kind of orangey color, the most most endangered being critically imperiled, being the this pink salmon color, and then vulnerable being in the light orange. So these three warm colors are the species that need conservation action now. Otherwise, over the next fifteen years, it's there. There's a chance they could go extinct. Um, and then in these cooler colors are the species that are apparently secure and secure, so doing well. And you can see in Canada, there are only three species that we are not worried about, which is pretty depressing. So there's a lot of information just sitting in this figure, and you, can, you get a sense of the diversity, the number of species in each country, and then also of how many are you need conservation action. And so this comes to 52%. Over half of the species in North America need conservation attention. And when we dive into this a little bit more, part of what's driving these conservation statuses are really what's happened to them over the past 15 years. So looking backwards um, from now, like going back 15 years, you can see that there's this kind of different trend where we had in Mexico, 62% of their species have decreased in population size over the past 15 years. 57% have decreased um, in the US and 35% have decreased in Canada. But again, there's a lot more to dive into here. So, here, um, uh, just a quick note, we did, um, we only assessed 89 of the Mexican species in depth of the 142 because there was a, a bunch here in this gray area that we either knew were doing really well or were really uh, critically imperiled. And so those ones that have been studied a lot because of their on either end of the spectrum we we narrowed down to generate that previous figure. And then, um, yes, I will, thank you. And then we have in the US and in Canada, these dark gray bars where we didn't have, we had insufficient reviewers. So every species in the US and Canada was assessed, but we were not able to get at least three um, experts for all of the species and that's because that's one of our first indications of data gaps where we don't have enough experts or enough people that know about these species to really say things uh, definitively. And so this is one area where we want to, from this report, start encouraging you know, new graduate students, other people to start um, you know, studying these, these species that we know um, less about. And this is actually particularly in the the western side of our, our country um, or our continent. So in the western U.S. and Canada, a lot of these species reside. So there's a lot more work to do there. Um, and then we also have some good news. It's not all doom and gloom. There are this light blue category of species that are, have been stable over the last 15 years. They're doing well. We don't really need to worry about them. It's good. If they, um, they've been able to, to manage all of the change that they've been facing um, in a, particularly in urban areas and things like that. So they're, they're doing well. And then we even have species that have been increasing, which is really, really nice to see. Um, and this is one of the things that we highlight more, you can look at in the actual report, like an example of one species in the US that we have data showing that it's been increasing is our gray bats. So it's actually a federally listed um, species that is protected and those protections appear to be working. So the, there's some really good things coming out of this that 
the federal protections that gray bats are seeing um, is actually leading them to, to increase and it's making a, a difference. So one thing I'm gonna zoom in on right now is are these red bars, right? So we have, a, we have information that a lot of species are decreasing, but when we zoom into that, it's actually a little bit more detail. And it also is not great, but not quite as bad as it looks on that previous graph. So when we kind of break up how much they've decreased over the past 15 years, we see that uh, from the dark red being, you know, close to going extinct, almost a 100% decline to, you know, these less serious categories. So this lightest, lightest pink is going to be a very slight decline. So only like a 10% decrease. In Mexico, most of the species of that, um, I think 62% here that decreased, most of them have only decreased slightly, only by 10%. But when we come down to Canada, we have this higher proportion of extreme declines. And so it's really in these, these two extreme and serious categories that we're saying we need to focus our conservation efforts and resources um, here. And then once we get a handle on those species, then we can come and assess these moderate and slight declines. But it but the results of this also help kind of us identify where to put our efforts, which is really important. All right, so the other big, um, the other big piece that we dove into is, here, let me see, it looks like some people are having trouble seeing the PowerPoint. So I'm gonna try resharing again. Let's try this. Uh, is where are the top threats to bats? So this was the biggest part of the expert elicitation, going through many many threats that are could face species. Everything from you know housing developments to um, pollution to climate change and really big categories and then we dove down into nitty-gritty you know, smaller categories within that and one of the biggest threats to bats in north america was invasive species and in particular the one that is driving that as a is a primary threat especially in the u.s and canada is white nose syndrome oh my there we go um we have done quite a bit of um, kind of sharing on at in social media and whatnot at batcon.org and on our kind of web page and Facebook on what is going on with white nose syndrome. But briefly, it is a, a non-native fungus, an invasive species that arrived in the United States in New York in a cave in 2006. And since it arrived in that cave, this fungus, Pseudogymnoastis destructans, we just call it PD, um, has spread from coast to coast in the US and Canada. And it has driven three of what used to be our, some of our most common species in the US to near extinction. So uh, one species, the Northern Long-Eared Bat, Myotis septentrionalis is now declined in many of its in many of the areas it's found by 99 percent caves where it used to be a common bat that we would catch anytime we were going out and studying bats they're no longer there and it's because this fungus um, disrupts them through hibernation and they burn through their fat reserves too quickly and aren't able to survive the winter and what's crazy is that this is not only happening in areas where there are harsh winters. It's happening all across the country. So I'm in Texas. Winters are fairly mild and bats are dying of white nose syndrome here too. So it's it's scary and it is a one of the top 
things that's threatening um, hibernating species in Canada and the US. And so this is a driver for a lot of these declines for many species. Another more broad threat that is facing a greater number of species, so it has a, a bigger scope, are these this kind of range of different threats to bat habitats. So depending on the species, they're going to use different habitats, but one of the biggest ones that was identified are disruption of caves. So cave roosts are an area where bats are congregating at some of their most vulnerable times of year. So when they're hibernating, they're going to be in caves. And, you know, this is when they're going to be trying to survive the winter. So that's even going into caves and any persecution at that time of year is really disruptful. Um, and then also in areas where they're not hibernating, a lot of times during the summer, these caves are used as maternity colonies. So that's where mothers are giving birth and raising their pups and people going into caves and in particular persecuting bats, it can be a real issue. Uh, and then an example of this from uh, Mexico, that's a, a really big issue are vampire bats live in caves and because they uh, feed on livestock, um, these ranchers really hate them and will go into caves and just kill all the bats and it, whether they know if they're vampire bats or not. So it's, it's not just, it's an issue driven by a, you know, pretty unique thing to vampire bats, but then it's, expanding to and impacting a much uh, wider variety of species um, just because they live in caves and bats are misunderstood. So this is an issue kind of across the continent. Another one that's very common is la loss of foraging habitat. Um, so through deforestation and um, kind of forest fires, all these things, there's a reduction in just areas that bats can go and, and eat insects. And then another one that came out across all three countries was pollution. And there's you know various types of pollution. It could be either uh, their water sources, their drinking sources are polluted, or it could be um, you know, emittents from, from commercial things and of accumulation of different harmful toxins in, in the insects that they're eating or in the water that they're drinking. So all these things just start to add up and add extra stressors to bats that are already stressed through another major threat that we are all familiar with, which is climate change. So within climate change, this is a, a huge topic. Um, but there were two kind of top subcategories within that that are really threatening bats across all three countries in North America. And the first one is drought. And just as humans, we are struggling with the impacts of drought on our water sources. So are bats. So bats need to drink water just like we do. But, you know, they can't turn on a faucet and take a drink. They need to have calm, clean standing water that they kind of fly by, open their mouth, take a sip of, and then keep flying. So especially in areas like um, kind of the Southwest deserts where kind of the standing water is really limited already. And then we have the impacts of drought kind of reducing the availability of that water. Um, they are just running out of places to go to get a drink. Um, and then there also is an impact on they will a lot of species will feed on insects that are associated with water. And so if the insects are doing poorly because there's not enough water for their reproduction, then the bats are also going to have a hard time eating. So it just all ends up, you know, impacting everything in the ecosystem. So climate change and in particular drought is a big one. And then another one that 
was showed up in all three countries as a major threat are extreme temperatures driven by climate change. So this can be either extreme hot temperatures and extreme cold temperatures. Um, you know, a lot of us have had, you know, snow apocalypses and all sorts of crazy weather in the past when um, the recent past winters. Um, and then also we've had record highs in a lot of places. Uh, just a personal kind of experience not that long ago is in Texas, we had this really devastating freeze in 2019. And this was kind of one of those situations where it really drove home for me, like how this is impacting bats. And so as, as you know, especially if you ever drive through Texas, there's this sign, bridge may ice in cold weather, or it'll freeze over before the road. Bridges freeze when it gets really cold. And so then we have all these structures that bats are taking advantage of, which should, you know, be a positive thing because they're, they have more roosting environment, but those bridges froze during that extreme cold event. And so did the bats in them. And there was a bridge that I went to and picked up over 4,000 dead bats. Um, like that's, it's just, it was just, you know, beyond awful. And that was just one roost. You know, and so that one extreme temperature event, high, high or low, can wipe out an entire colony. It's it has it's really devastating. So, you know, what can we do to address climate change? It's this huge issue. And you know, one of the things is investing in renewable energy. And unfortunately, this is also uh, both the answer and a problem for bats. And renewable energy was also a top threat um, in North America and continues to be globally, and it's threatening migratory bat species in particular. So this is mostly driven by wind energy development and wind turbines, but there's other renewable energy that also impacts bat species just through a uh, uh, non kind of responsible development practices in particular. But renewable energy, in particular, these wind turbines can cause really high mortality for migratory bats um, as they fly through on their, their fall or spring migration. And is the, the hoary bat is now being considered for um, being listed as endangered in Canada and is being discussed for listing as endangered in the United States because of this. So these are just some of the threats that are facing bats in North America, and there are more. So it's, it is depressing. Um, so this is where this messaging really comes to being bats need us, right? There is this great need to protect bats. They are extremely important to us. We need them, and so now's the time that we all need to work together to support them. And there's a lot of ways that you can do this. Um, one of them is just being a bat advocate, telling people how awesome bats are, because it. I know it sounds corny, but every one bat that we protect makes a difference for those bat populations, especially the ones that are in our own backyards that are literally endangered on and on the brink of extinction. So just letting people know that those that bats are awesome. And if one, you know, gets lost and gets in your house, don't kill it, you know, get some get help getting it out in a safe and humane way so that it, it can go back to living its life and you can get back to living your life. Um, and so being that advocate is really important, but then also uh, it's it's important that we you know support legislation and all these things and kind of make show what's important to us through our votes, through how we we spend and our decisions that we make um, through our economy and government. So there's there's things like that we that we can do uh, a few times a year. And then lastly, just in your own backyard, 
supporting healthy habitats. So putting in a back garden is what I'm working on in my own backyard. And it's as simple as planting native plants. And then we are also working on developing kind of regional guides to show which plants in particular are good for bats because they are um, going to be supporting the insects that bats eat. Um, so look for kind of night blooming flowers, things with white flowers, and in general, just look for native species that you can plant in your backyard. So please take a look at the State of the Bats report, stateofthebats.org, and you know, let us know if you have questions. I would love to answer all the questions that have been popping into your head as I've been talking all this time. So um, please put some more in the chat and let me know uh, what you're curious about. Oh, that was a really great talk, Amanda. All right, so we've got um, about 20 minutes left for questions. So like Amanda said, um, do post them in the Q&A box. Um, I'll shift over there right now um, to see what yeah, questions have so far. Um, all right, let's see. Do, do, do. What have we got? <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can see it. So I'm going to go back to Mary's question. Uh, when white nose started killing bats across the U.S. and Canada, it was predicted that farmers would need more chemical pesticides. Um, and I actually do not know the answer to this question, but it's a great question. So as we've had a decrease in these bat populations, and we it's been happening for like over 10 years now, um, have we seen a need to like supplement with more kind of chemical insect control since the bats aren't, we don't have as many bats out there doing their job. Um, I don't know of any studies that have quantified that, but I will look into it. And um, I do know that there has a lot of people have like seen a, like noticed a decrease and I've heard that from farmers as well. So I know they're seeing it like visually in their own like personal anecdotes, but whether they're actually seeing it like economically or on their, with a pest consumption of their crops, I have not seen that, but that's a great question. All right, so uh, the next question um, from Julie, uh, how strong are endangered species protections both uh, all across North America basically? Yeah, so every country is different. Um, and one of the issues that all countries face in wildlife protection broadly, but then especially with bats, because they are so cryptic and hard to track, is enforcement. So even if a species is listed as endangered, has federal protections, if something happens to them and someone like acts illegally, um, it is really that enforcement is where things fall apart. And I think that is an issue that every country faces. Um, some countries are better than others, like the UK is probably one of the best at protecting their bat species. So hopefully we can keep getting better and better across the whole continent. Great. Um, so question from Kristen. Uh, I think this is referring back to the assessments of um, which bats are most at risk, etc. Um, did the experts use NatureServe and NatureServe Canada conservation status rank information to help inform their assessments? Yes, Kristen, I love this question. Yes. So this was all done uh, following a subset of the full NatureServe criteria to, to get those conservation statuses. And um, so we were assessing using, in particular, uh, range size and uh, so range extent, population size, short term trend, and uh, went through all of the threats, assessed for scope and severity, and got uh, threat impact. 
and we're using the guidance and the calculator for nature serve yeah. uh, from Mary. Um, do we know why? Oh, I lost it. Uh, oh, is it that protections for gray bats are working? Uh, that they're moving into spots opened up by the decline of little brown bats from white nose syndrome, or both? Ooh, Mary, um, that is a good question. And I'm going to be honest, I am not a gray bat expert. I've never even seen one, which is so embarrassing. Um, so there are definitely species that have kind of, we think, taken up that spot uh, vacated, vacated by little brown bats. Um, I know big brown bats are are one that we think are doing that. I'm not sure if uh, gray bats are as well. And, and I do believe that it's also the protection. So it's quite possible that it's both, but I'm not sure if there's a study on the gray bat, little brown bat kind of interaction. Okay. Um, this one comes from both Fran and Julie. Um, do we know why the bats in Canada are declining so much? Is deforestation part of it? Um, and as well, we did have um, uh, Professor Joanna Coleman um, give her perspective on it. Um, she's um, in the IUCN group leader, originally from Canada herself, and she said that she suspects that these are Myotis lucifugus, M. septentrionalis, and Perimyotis subflavus, all of which have suffered severe white nose syndrome mortality in Canada. This is why Co Seawick um, recommended they be considered for listing as endangered nationwide. Uh, what do you have to say to that? Yeah, Joanna, hi. Uh, Joanna is definitely an expert, and um, that is exactly the answer. So the little brown bats, uh, northern long-eared bats, and tricolored bats are the, the three species that have been hit hardest by white nose syndrome and have the greatest declines of over 90% um, in the U.S. and basically the same decreases in Canada. And um, so because Canada has fewer species with 17 species, just with three of those being hit so hard, that ends up being a higher proportion of the bat species, you know, that have that are doing really poorly. And then there's also those are the three species that are being hit by are impacted by white nose syndrome the most, but there are more species than that. Um, I believe it's 12 species across. Uh, both countries, U.S. and Canada, that are, you know, dying because of the the fungus and have white nose syndrome. So yeah. it's it's really that is the main driver. But there are other issues: um, habitat loss, extreme temperatures, and um, what was it? Renewable energy and, and also mining all also are, were some of the top threats in Canada, causing decreases in species beyond white nose syndrome. Um, so focusing on white nose syndrome, um, uh, related to what Tim has asked, uh, what groups are working on eliminating white nose syndrome and what are some of those, what do some of those efforts look like? Well, there, I mean, I think while white nose syndrome is obviously depressing and devastating um, and a great example of the importance of biosecurity from and in reducing invasive, invasive species from coming into new ecosystems. Um, it's also been a really great example of how people can work cooperatively across um, kind of binationally to be working on something together. And so U.S. and Canada governments have been working together really closely to address this. The White Nose um, Syndrome Response Team is, is led by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but is made up of many, many individuals, um, researchers, state and federal partners, uh, provincial partners, um, and a lot of people working together to solve this from many angles. So, it, you know, it started with just identifying the fungus and naming it and then renaming it. 
um, to testing out different potential treatments in the lab and then bringing those out into um, into the, the field setting or the wild to see if they're effective outside of the lab and focusing on kind of why it was killing the bats, just figuring out that mechanism took years. Uh, so there are a lot of different academic labs that are, are still testing and looking at different treatments. We haven't had a whole lot of success to date on things that are scalable solutions. Um, there is one very promising potential vaccine that is developed by the USGS um, National Wildlife Health Center that's being tested uh, and multiple hibernacula right now that is looking pretty exciting. And kind of the other side of the coin is while some groups are still working to come up with a treatment um, to white nose syndrome, others are focusing on protecting and supporting those individuals that have survived this so far. So what, why were they able to survive when others in their colonies could not? And this is kind of one of the projects that um, I work with and our white nose syndrome uh, team at Bat Conservation International is working on. And we have a, our fat bat project where we're trying to support um, species that go into hibernation and making it easy for them to get fat before they go into hibernation. So they have more fat reserves. And then even if they are infected by the fungus and get, um, then they have more energy stores to get them through the winter. And then they can come out and, you know, go and reproduce in the summer. So there's, there's lots of people working on this. Um, and yeah, and that's it. Oh, I I see. Oh, Linda, you're okay. I, I was going to go into um, Vanita Fuller's question. I really like this. Um, this question was due to white nose. Should individuals not maintain bat houses to prevent spread? Or does maintaining small bat houses help to prevent spread by allowing bats alternative roosting sites? Love this question. So um, it is bat houses are, are not actually really uh, an issue for white nose syndrome too much because when the bats move out of their hibernacula, so this cave where they're spending all winter and they go out into like the hot summer heat, they actually shed the fungus. So they're going to maybe come out of hibernation sick and scrawny and just be really hanging on for life at that moment. But then as they go out, you know, there's more insects are flying around there. The fungus is, is dying because of the temperatures outside of the cave and the bats are starting to, you know, eat and build up their um, their fat reserves and build that muscle back up. Um, so when that's when they're going to go into bat houses is during the summer. And so it's not really, it's not an issue during the summer. It's just during the winter. So it's, they're not getting reinfected until they go back into their hibernacula in those caves. So unless it's a bat house in a, one of those winter sites, um, then it's not a problem. I think really having a properly built bat house that gives them um, a way to move across thermal uh, kind of microclimates within the bat house is important because some of the the more poorly designed bat houses will cause kind of bats if they're if they really like the bat house they'll get they can get trapped up in the top and then during extreme heat then individuals can be at risk of um, dying because of overheating if they don't have kind of ways to move around within that bat house. So um, if you're thinking about putting out a bat house, I recommend looking at our resources at batcon.org. And we actually have plans for a couple different designs of bat houses that we recommend, just PDFs that you can print out if you wanna uh, dive into some woodworking. And then there's also a lot of vendors that 
that we will sell you a really nice bat house. But I will say if it costs $30 on Amazon, uh, it's too good to be true. And it's probably not going to be very helpful to the bats. Good to know. Certainly good to know. Um, a question from Jennifer on Facebook. Um, are some bats developing resistance to white nose syndrome? Is that a thing? Ooh, yes. So um, there is there is some evidence that little brown bats may be adapting to survive with white nose syndrome. And they are, you know, their populations have still declined by a ton, but not to the same degree that northern long-eared bats populations have. So I think northern long-eared bat populations have collapsed so much that the amount of time that they would need to adapt, they, like their populations, they're just don't, there's not enough individuals really for there to be that enough time without more protections for them with all the other kind of threats that they face beyond white nose syndrome. But little brown bats, um, there seems to be something about them, maybe a little bit hardier that they are potentially adapting. And so there is this kind of like ray of, of sunlight for them that maybe that's, that's the case. So uh, yeah, we'll see. And if people are interested in kind of diving into the nitty gritty of these studies, um, you can always follow up after the webinar and we can share kind of some of those those scientific links with you. Yeah, definitely. And just to confirm, Mary asks this is a similar question. There's no sort of like fungicide that you can spray them with. Is that the case? Um, so one of the issues is there are things that will kill the fungus. Yes. The problem is that the bats and what and the pseudogymnoasis destructans fungus are not the only things in these ecosystems. And I'm a little biased and I'm like, well, don't we just care about the bats? But apparently there are other, other important things in living in these caves that make them important, healthy ecosystems. So by spraying kind of these general fungicides, then we can also be killing beneficial, healthy fungus, bacteria, other um, microorganisms in these cave habitats that would potentially trigger other unknown effects that could be detrimental. Um, so there are things that are being looked at that have been shown to not be harmful to the other organisms living in these environments. And that's one of the first steps to moving into these field tests is showing that it's not just going to make this cave sterile um, of any other life except for the bats. Um, but that is one of the, the hard parts. Okay. Well, um, switching to climate change, um, Aaron asks, are researchers seeing a northward shift in North American bat species due to climate change? Are they all just moving up a, a couple states and provinces? Yeah, so I think most of the studies I've seen have been conducted outside of the U.S. Um, and outside of North America, but there is evidence that there are species that are being found at um, higher elevations than they ever have been before. And, and this is an issue for most organisms, that as things grow grow hotter, one way to escape that instead of just shifting up in latitude is really to shift up in elevation. And the problem is, is that you can only go up so high, right? You can't, once you get to the top of a mountain, that's as far as you can go. So there are um, shifts in several species in elevation. We're also seeing uh, range expansions that may also, it's hard to identify if they're expansions or shifts um, at this point in time, but we're seeing bats in places we've never seen them before and new occurrences of individuals kind of and most of that is probably driven by by climate change yeah got it um b would like to know the t what are the non-responsible renewable actions is that something you can talk about spill the tea <laughs> so um one of the big one of the biggest things with renewable energy um, 
it are companies that are willing to work with conservationists and apply the actions that are found to help save the bats. Um, so I think that's the biggest area is a lot of times we have a great idea of what to do to save up to to make a difference and reduce uh, mortality. But the tough part is that being uh, put into action on the ground and it um, those companies using it. So it, it really comes down to you know, these private companies being willing to come to the table and and work with us and and talk with us. And so that's that's on the plus side, there are companies that are doing that. And so we have amazing models of what a great partnership looks like. And hopefully that'll continue to grow and other companies can see how beneficial it is to partner with groups like Bat Conservation International and other conservation groups. Well, that's great. Um, so we will, I'll ask one last question. Um, so we have one last minute. Um, do so one person had asked regarding the wind turbine problem um so apparently painting one blade helps birds is that a reasonable solution for bats i don't know so this is um there are way fewer bat researchers out there than there are bird researchers so that is one of the things that we've been been looking into um and we're actually working on a um Kind of some scientific literature to put out there and kind of, kind of creatively think about things from a different angle than they've been thought about before. Um, so there is a lot of what we focus on with bats is their unique ability to echolocate. You know, they're they're so good at moving around in the dark with their echolocation and hunting and you know detecting tiny insects and you know not running into trees at night and these things, it's like, why are, why are turbines an issue? And so one of the big questions is like, we don't know why they are attracted to them. So there's something very different going on with bats and wind turbines than with any other taxa. And um, personally, I think it's because bats are too smart. Um, a lot of what we see in videos is they just look curious, like, it's not that they don't know that the wind turbines are there. They're very aware. Um, they just, you know, when you have propellers, like these blades moving very quickly and they're the size of a football field rotating in a field. And, you know, you have this like three inch animal. The That perspective is something that we're looking into. Like how are bats perceiving these wind turbines? What are they picking up on? Um, so a lot of the research so far has been focused on their echolocation, but they have many other senses that could be playing a role. And so with birds, you know, it was immediately focused on that it's going to be driven by vision. Um, and so now we're we're looking into ways that it could be something visual uh, for bats and painting the blades is is one of those those options. Um, and there's other things that have to do with maybe like the lighting at the turbines um, and really at the at the whole wind farm scale that could that could play a role. The other part could be the texture of the blades. Um, but that then goes back to what I was saying before is even if we find out that, let's say we needed the blades to be another texture, it's it's quite possible that, that texture would make the wind turbines less effective at, you know, capturing wind energy. And so then getting that adopted by the wind industry would be really tough. And that was totally a hypothetical. We don't know if texture would make a difference. Just an example of even if we do identify it, getting it implemented tends to be the bigger, the bigger uh, challenge. Got it. Um, multifaceted issues here. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Well, so thank you again, Amanda, uh, for taking the time to break down the state of the bats of North America report. Uh, you have definitely illustrated some fascinating info from the report, and I'm sure our audience feels the same. 
Uh, thank you as well to the audience for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about our efforts to conserve North American bats and our other programs, visit our website at batcon.org. That's B-A-T-C-O-N dot O-R-G. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our mailing list and newsletter. Um, so that's all for now. I hope everyone loves bats even more than they did an hour ago. And uh, we'll see you at the next Bat Chat. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.